used a new set of techniques, which had been mastered in Italy, but put them within the context of Russian symbols. The Finnish cathedral stood over 150 feet tall. It was a stunning and imposing edifice. With his symbol of power in place, Ivan was now ready to challenge the Tatars. Their response is quick. They raise a massive army and charge Moscow. Ivan raises his own force, and the two sides clash at the Ugra River, 300 miles west of Moscow. After months of standoff, the Russians finally overrun the Tatars. Ivan had successfully vanquished the oppressors, who had subjugated the Russians for nearly three centuries. And with his legacy cemented in mighty monuments of brick and stone, Ivan III becomes Ivan the Great. By the time of his death in 1505, Ivan had created an independent Russia, but he had not yet created an empire. That distinction would belong to another Ivan, whose absolute authority and inhuman cruelty would earn him the title Ivan the Terrible. In 1472, Ivan III married Sophia Paleologus, the niece of the last emperor of Byzantium. Pope Paul II arranged the marriage. At the end of Ivan the Great's reign in 1505, he had freed the Russian people from subservience to the Tatars and tripled Moscow's territory. In other words, it went from 15,000 square miles to 45,000 square miles, which was an enormous accomplishment in itself, and that would earn him the title the Great. But the Tatars were still a problem. Although they had retreated from Moscow, their capital, Kazan, stood in the way of Russia's expansion east. It would take the dark determination of Ivan III's grandson to rid Russia of the Tatars and transform it into an empire. He would become known as Ivan the Terrible. I think the greatest single period of expansion was under um, Ivan uh, the Terrible. The Muscovite Tsardom encompassed the Volga, the Ural regions, and then eventually all of uh, Siberia. This great emperor would start out as a deeply troubled young man. Ivan's father died when he was a child, leaving him witness to a brutal struggle for power involving torture, execution, and murder. These atrocities would scar Ivan for life. Ivan the Terrible's traumatic background as a child, I think, produced uh, and Ivan, who was terrible, uh, even a, as a young child, he tortured animals. He seemed to be cruel and sadistic. By the time he came to power in 1547, he was convinced that he was personally anointed by God to rule Russia. He was the first Russian ruler to have himself crowned formally as Tsar. And Tsar is simply a Russian derivative of Caesar. It's an imperial title. As Tsar, Ivan found the perfect outlet for his fierce and ruthless intellect by launching Russia's first modern offensive called the Siege of Kazan. Ivan first created a new army of nearly 150,000 men, including artillery and engineering units trained in the latest siege tactics from Europe. His engineers adapted these foreign teachings to suit Russian warfare. In a first for Russian engineering, they designed a portable structure to defend Russian troops on Eurasia's exposed plains. It was called the Gulai Gorod. This was actually a movable fortress. Gulai Gorod consisted of wooden screens or wooden boards. These shields were assembled in varying patterns to defend infantry gunners called strelsi, the Russian word for shooter. Russian infantry stood inside these movable fortress and used uh, guns, used cannons against the cavalry. And another way to use it was against the besieged city like Kazan. 
August 23, 1552, with his army assembled and equipped, Ivan begins fighting his way to Kazan. It was done very ingeniously as the Russians moved up and would very quickly erect prefabricated log fortresses as they inched ever closer to Kazan. In other words, tightening the noose around the city. Once entrenched outside the city, Ivan's troops unleashed a relentless assault, rolling in 30-foot-high gulag rods to fire a barrage of artillery over the fortress walls. They killed many, many defenders in the streets of the city using these movable towers. But the fortress stood strong. So Ivan's generals ordered in a team of engineers to take a crack at the castle. They devise a daring plan to tunnel under the fortress walls, lay mines, and blow the fort wide open. On September 30th, they light a fuse that would decide the bloody fate of Kazan. The force of the explosion stops the battle in its tracks. That was the signal to, to the rest of the army, and all the regiments of the Tsarist army simultaneously started the assault of the fortress. After eight days of bloody battle, Kazan falls. Ivan was a conqueror, and Russia becomes an empire. This was a monumental feat uh, because the taking of Kazan uh, meant that uh, Russia was incorporating the former Tartar lands uh, to which she had been beholden. Uh, and Kazan opened the way for Russia to expand truly into an empire. It opened the way south to the Caspian and the Black Seas, and it opened the way east to Siberia. In 1555, to commemorate his victory, Ivan commissions a building that would become the most recognizable symbol of the Russian Empire. Today, it's known as St. Basil's Cathedral. The Cathedral of the Intercession, which we know as St. Basil's, is based on the technology of brick towers that the Italians brought in and the Russians later adapted to create votive tower churches. Constructed almost entirely of brick, the cathedral was actually eight churches in one. It was laid out in a geometric pattern, with each church circling a central tower, symbolizing the eight days of the siege of Kazan. In the 1580s, the cathedral's most distinctive feature was added. The Onion Dome takes its form, its image, from that flare that occurs at its base. It rests on a cylinder called a drum, and from that cylinder, the top of that cylinder, it flares out very sharply, rises up, and then culminates in a peak. That is the Onion Dome. The Onion Domes on St. Basil's were completely unique. Each one was constructed of individually textured, hand-painted metal sheaths laid over an iron frame. If you strip that metal sheath away, it would look something like a birdcage that had been squashed so that you got the flare. The result was a stunning architectural feat never before seen in Russia. By 1553, Ivan's dominions were the largest in Europe, and he was at the height of his power. But his deepening paranoia and iron grip on the jugular of the nation were slowly strangling his empire. He launched a series of costly and foolish wars and sadistically struck out at anyone who opposed his power.